Welcome back, everybody. I am your friendly neighborhood CRT repairman, Steve. And today I've got a special treat for you. We're going to go jump into the way back machine and go back almost 30 years and work on a CRT today from 1992. That is a Sony PVM 1943MD. Now, this is a monitor that I've worked on a couple times before with some other things. I did some live shows. I will be tagging some videos that might be very important in this uh, small little cut-through video. We're going to do talking specifically, again, about a Sony PVM 1943MD. And let's just go ahead and start rolling this wonderful footage I've got here of this PVM. Now, again, this one's from 1992. It does represent the first actual box style uh, PVM, and that's this exterior with uh, the buttons on the front and all that, especially for like a medical monitor. Uh, so if you would have normally seen a monitor like this attached to something like a scope, or some type of ultrasound machine in the early 1990s. So if you were born in 1993, you might have had your picture taken on one of these uh, if your parents went and got an ultrasound that year. Uh, but anyway, I want to show you some pictures before of this monitor and the condition that it's in currently. So I'm going to drop myself out of the picture here for just a second and kind of show you some before action shots. So this was one of the major problems on this monitor. Let me back up just a second and show you what it is. First, we've got a pretty good uh, issue here on this right-hand side with our geometry. And that's just a big black line down the side and a couple of wonky spots on that side. And then we've also got the clock down here on my display. Uh, again, this is just running from a program, but the reason I'm showing is you can see an enormous amount of convergence in this corner where on my camera you can literally see the red lines separated from the green and the blue there on the bottom so that's all stuff we're gonna need to repair and tighten up I just did want to show though again before sh uh, footage of this monitor because I often get asked you know, what does it look like prior to me recapping and this is before I recapped the monitor or before I did really any work to the monitor, I just turned it right on and this is what it looked like. Again, it looked quite blurry uh, because of the convergence. The convergence was a big issue on this one. There also was a bit of a screen blur where it was out of focus just slightly. And um, I don't feel, I feel like there were some capacitors that were probably failing and not giving us the best look on the sides for like pin cushion because those should be a little bit more uniform than what they look like right now on the screen. But anyway, here's, this is just a quick look of what this thing was looked like before. Now, if you want to see a video about me recapping this monitor, uh, I will tag it right here. It was a live show where I took the monitor apart on the live show, and then I actually went ahead and pulled all the boards. I showed you how I did that because this one had a lot of different boards and a lot of little pr proprietary connectors in it. And so uh, it's very important to make sure you do all that, take your time, especially with something like this. Lots of wires, lots of boards, and uh, lots of old plastic that could crack and break if you didn't specifically unscrew everything or you know you could bend and even crack a circuit board, which would cause all kinds of trouble. So anyway, I will tag those videos again up top, and it is a, about an hour and a half of me tearing down this monitor live, and then um, I do also have a secondary video following up with that that shows the boards, and I discuss how I made my individual cap kit for this monitor, and um, the last thing I did after I put all this together was I did apply some fresh dielectric grease, which... Uh, will limit the amount of sound that comes off of that flyback area back there. You just make sure there's no dust or hair or lint or anything in that. And then you won't have any, you know, crackles or pops and, and make sure you get a good seal against the back of your tube. But um, the last thing I did was I did put this little red thing on the wrong side over here. I had to, I, I needed to get a little further away from the neck of the CRT and everything, but all in all, that probably took me about 20 minutes to put the thing back together, even after uh, this time-lapse video shows it's sped up. 
it was quite complex to put it back together. And that's just simply because there's so many daughter boards and you know, a lot of these boards were actually consolidated on later models. So let's go ahead. I'm going to pull myself a picture out of the picture again, and we'll look at some tests here. So first I've got a little smaller monitor set up. This is a Sony PVM 8220. And the reason I did that was just, I wanted to have a composite video test on this monitor. This monitor does do composite S video and RGB, but that way I could see there is no service menu. So I could see if something was going to come up right when I turned it on. So uh, it's always good to have something, you know, that you know is working. And so that's why I had the 8220 here because it's just a little, um, a little PVM that does S video and uh, composite. So it's a good idea to you know, run the DVD player through it and then loop that through the Sony PVM 1943MD. So again, this is a medical version of this monitor. It came out really well. I think the picture looks pretty good. This is again before I have made any real adjustments to it. This does match up with the 1944Q or a 2044Q, 2043Q. And then you may also have like a 13 or 14 inch version of this that looks or operates the same. And these kind of functions will, will be the same for either one of those monitors. Next, I wanna show you some RGB. We'll do some before and after screens here on how this will uh, came out as far as you know the, the look of the screens before any kind of calibration adjustment. And so we're looking at just grids and other patterns to see what our screen looks like, again, prior to me going in and making the geometry adjustments. Now, I did also make a very big video about the geometry on this specific monitor. It's about 30 minutes, and it shows you how to get into the back of the CRT, which I'm going through right this second, and shows you how to operate these potentiometers which are in the back again of the monitor and those are your controls that you have to use to be able to make any kind of screen adjustment for geometry um, that includes your under scan settings they are on there too so there's a listing right across here of what each one of these settings will actually adjust there is a daughter board again in here too that's a v board that does have some adjustments where if you need to make like a quick color or screen brightness adjustment, you can do that by using those adjustments. But the main thing in here was to just get in there and start using those potentiometers. So again, I will tag that right here above if you want to see exactly how to get in and calibrate uh, a monitor like this, because you're always going to, even after recapping it, there's always going to be some kind of need to make a little bit of an adjustment most of the time. And that's why it's always a good idea to replace any capacitors and do any hardware work before you actually get in and start working on it. Now, I wanted to go over something really quick here. This is, again, after. This is after the... Uh, repairs have all been done grain grain play and a screen scratch so i want to show you what i did notice about this monitor uh this is again after the fact but i want to show you up here next to bald bull's head right up here i'm going to circle it with my cursor there's a scratch on the screen and it's like a hairline scratch it really shows up well though on this picture you'll see a second i'm going to use my finger and rub it but that scratch is on this screen. So unfortunately, that's stuck in this layer of glass and is not really removable. So as I promised, right now, before I go and jump into this, just so you know, these are pictures of before I did the cap work and adjustment and then after I did the cap work and adjustment. So I'll show you, again, the same shots from before and after coming up right here. And then we'll go through and talk about what uh, some uh, things I noticed. So again, this is that big long side that you saw earlier in the video. And it's against that right hand side of the monitor when you look at the screen. Uh, and that was an offset. And then again, we had the convergence issues. But this is after recap and calibrations. That screen is pushed all the way up to the side there. And we have no black line. And we also got a way tighter convergence uh, down here on our 
bottom portion and corners of our screen. Again, this is like before I did anything, any adjustments or any kind of capacitor replacement. A lot of convergence in this corner and then after. Now it's not perfect. You could still see some blooming on the edges where it blooms off to the right a little bit, but it has got to be three or 400 times better than what we started with. And I ran up smack against the wall here I'll pause it just a second. I ran smack up against the wall here where I had to uh, I had to stop the adjusting the calibrations because there was no better screen. You couldn't make it look any better than what it had. Same thing with the convergence rings and all that stuff. So I'll show you again. If you want to go back and look at the calibration video, it is tagged. But there will be some other things about uh, convergence that I'll show you coming up. But there might be a point, especially on an older monitor that's almost 30 years old, where you can't actually get it to uh, adjust any better than what it like is on the screen. And that's kind of the point I got to with this screen. I want you to take a slight or a very close look over here to the right-hand side of this screen. I'll show you some things that, again, I could not get uh, fixed fully. But this is a before and after shot of the grid now. And... The grid is just pushed up to where I like to have it, where the dots are almost, you know, halfway between the wall and the, uh, you know, the the wall of the screen edge, and your overscan area needs to be somewhere in between those lines. And I go through that more on the recapping and uh, recalibration video. But this is something that I had trouble with on this monitor, even after recapping an adjustment. I could still not get rid of this screen bow in the bottom right-hand side of the uh, monitor. I couldn't get rid of that little bow there no matter what I did. So uh, sometimes you're just going to have to live with a little bit of flaws in your screen, like I said, especially for a tube that's 30 years old. Let me show you this CRT convergence tool today. It's this Klein optical lens. I've done a specific video on how amazing this tool is. And I'll link to that video also so you can understand a little bit more on that. And I'll also link to a convergence video finally so you can understand how to make more adjustments for convergence because I did do a complete and detailed convergence video before. So you take this lens, you put it up to a nice pattern of lines across the screen. And on the screen now you can see how it splits those up into red, green, and blue. The lenses do and you can easily tell which line is either too high or too low in comparison to the other two lines. And then there are dials on the side of here which allow you to show whether one color, like example red on this right, and then blue is controlled on the uh, other side. I'm sorry, the right is blue and the left is red when you spin these. And you could show, see whether one of your guns needs to go up a little bit or down a little bit and that's uh, a good you know, tool you can also check to see how far you are within like a tolerance of uh, being within convergence and everything else so that's gonna be everything on the before and after like uh, you know geometry calibrations but I did still want to show off a little bit of gameplay here just because uh, my personal opinion on this monitor is still, it looks fantastic. Even though it does have that little screen scratch, there was also another slight repair that I did have to make on the back of it. And this is, I want to show it side by side with a 14 inch. So you can see what the difference is again on the size between a 14 inch and a 19 or I mean, 13, 20, you know, however you want to say it. Uh, but it's a technically 19 inch tube. And then, also a 14 inch tube. So that's pretty much the end of that restoration video. And um, let me know if you guys have any questions or comments about this one. Now this video monitor will eventually be for sale. Uh, I am going to adjust the pricing and uh, base it upon a couple things. So there's obviously the screen scratch, which is not going to be fixable. It's going to be there forever. And uh, so that's a ding against it. We've also got the slight bow in the one corner that I couldn't get fixed. So that's another slight ding against it. The last thing that happened was the back plastic on it actually got a tiny crack in it um, in the top hands corners. So I had to take the black back plastic out and epoxy that plastic crack, those cracks back together with some high quality epoxy. That way 
you know, they won't have any trouble that those cracks won't actually fall apart, but they are still there. So those are all the negatives. But the positives are this one does have a 600 line TV screen that supports RGB. And um, you can convert that, R, you know, component over to RGB pretty easily with some devices that I've actually got, you know, like a Garo or some of the Behabar Brothers uh, devices can be used to convert our component into RGB, just in case you only have a monitor like this that only does RGB. This doesn't do components. So that's a downside. But again, it's still a great monitor and uh, has a lot of life left in it, especially now with all the caps. So if you get one of these, I definitely recommend uh, giving it a good service because I think they stopped making these somewhere in about 1993, maybe 1994. So all of them are definitely over 25 years old. But that's pretty much everything that you need to know again about this one. Look for maybe a future video that will be very short explaining kind of the details on the possible sale that would be going on for this one. But I'm your host, Steve. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I'll see you guys next time with some more retro content.